Thank you for joining us for the Sterling News, read by Nefeli Schneider. Today we will be reading the following main articles. Study, Americans' pay hasn't fully recovered from inflation. Will it ever? Trump unveils crypto project, says U.S. should dominate sector. Want cheaper college? Pay interest while in school. Also, following up with miscellaneous articles. Study, Americans' pay hasn't fully recovered from inflation. Will it ever? Americans could take these frustrations to the voting booth come November. This article is by Sarah Foster from Bankrate.com. For 13 years, the 3% annual salary boost that Ricardo M. could count on every October felt like a beacon of stability and a nod that his loyalty as a plumbing supply salesman was being rewarded. But in the aftermath of post-pandemic inflation surge, these raises have since lost their luster. His grocery bills have doubled. The cost of filling up his Toyota 4Runner has jumped to $70 a week, and he's had to dip into his savings to avoid taking on credit card debt. All the while, his pay increase, increases have stayed the same. Inflation has taken it all, says Ricardo, a California resident who requested that his last name be abbreviated so he could speak freely about his employment situation. I know costs are going up everywhere, and I understand that a business has to make money and stay profitable. But at the same time, don't forget about the people who are bringing you business. I don't make enough for the sales that I generate. Economists have celebrated inflation's rapid descent and perhaps even more the relatively little pain it's caused the U.S. job market. For over a year now, wages have been rising faster than inflation as prices slow and the job market holds up, giving Americans an opportunity to recover the buying power that they lost after ultra-low interest rates, supply shortages, and a stimulus check-fueled spending boom combined to form the worst inflation crisis in 40 years. But the race isn't over yet. The past 16 months of real wage growth, as economists have called it, haven't been enough to offset the 25 months where prices were rising disproportionately faster than Americans' paychecks, according to a new analysis of Bureau of Labor Statistics data from Bankrate. Bankrate's 2024 Wage to Inflation Index Since the beginning of the post-pandemic inflation surge in January 1, 2021, prices have risen 20% compared with a 17.4% increase in wages over the same period, Bankrate's second annual wage to inflation index found. Inflation feels akin to taking a pay cut, helping explain why Americans have been so downtrodden from the U.S. economy. Despite a half-century low unemployment rate at the time, the majority, 59% of Americans, said in Bankrate poll from December 2023 that they felt like the U.S. economy was in a recession. Americans could even take these frustrations to the voting booth come November. Most adults, 89%, say the economy will be an important factor in determining their vote, with two-thirds, or 62%, calling it very important, according to Bankrate's Biden and Americans Personal Finance Survey from November 2023. To be sure, some ground had already been recovered. Thanks to over a year of real wage growth, the current gap between wage growth and inflation, 2.6 percentage points, marks major improvement from when it was at its widest in the summer of 2022, 3.9 3.9 points. Yet, wages have recently lost some momentum. In Bank Rate's 2023 index, Americans' paychecks were on track to fully recover from post pandemic inflation by the fourth quarter of this year. Now, Americans' paychecks are on pace to bounce back by the end of the second quarter of 2025, updates the Bank Rate's index for 2024 found. The job market has cooled more than expected this year. Wages are taking longer to recover amid a faster-than-expected cool-down in the job market, which has already stripped workers of some of their bargaining power to ask for higher pay. 
Between the second quarter of 2023 and 2024, prices rose 3.194%, nearly matching the 3.187% expected increase from last year's index. Wages, however, rose 4.03% over the same period, after previously being on pace to grow 4.6%. The labor market functions much like any other open market, economists say. Wage growth is often a reflection of who has the upper hand, the employer or the employee. When there are too many job openings and not enough workers, employers compete for talent by lifting pay or offering big bonuses. But too few jobs for the number of people seeking work might make Americans hesitant to leave their current positions, wary about how greener other pastures might actually be in a more competitive job market. If they've been on the hunt for a while, they might be inclined to settle for a job that pays less. And if they're so inclined to negotiate for higher pay, they might not ask for as much. We're seeing wage growth cool because demand is falling, says Sam Kuhn, labor economist at AppCast, a recruiting platform. In 2022, there were serious labor shortages. As that gap has closed, there's just less incentive to give out higher wages or yearly raises. Illustrating the shift, there's now just one job opening per every unemployed worker, the smallest ratio since April 2018, Bureau of Labor Statistics data shows. Employers have created an average 96,000 jobs in the private sector over the past three months, a massive slowdown from a three-month moving average of 203,000 in March. The hiring rate, meanwhile, has plunged to levels that are even lower than they were before the pandemic. Unemployment is now at the highest since before the pandemic. ADP's chief economist, Neela Richardson, has watched wage growth for job changers dip from a high of 16.4% in June 2022 to the most recent level of 7.3%, according to data that her firm collects. Americans who stayed at their current positions, meanwhile, saw their pay increase 4.8% for the second month in a row, ADP data also shows. In the leisure and hospitality sector, Richardson says she's starting to notice that workers are accepting new positions for less pay than they were making previously, echoing trends from before the pandemic and painting a picture of a slowing labor market. There's a lot of reasons workers switch jobs that aren't tied primarily to compensation, she adds. It could be a better shift, a better team, a better location. What happens next for the U.S. job market can have grave implications for Americans' prospects of catching up. In June, economists projected the job growth over the next year would average 115,000 jobs a month, Bankrate's quarterly economic indicator survey found. That would represent an even sharper slowdown in labor demand, with job growth currently averaging 197,000 over the past 12 months. A cooling economy means less inflation, but slower wage growth, too, setting Americans back in their game of catch-up. Richardson says a valid concern is whether their wages will recover at all. Will workers make up the ground lost when real wages weren't growing with inflation? From what I see in key sectors, the answer is not likely, Richardson said. It's really about can the wage level remain above current inflation to get a better picture for workers. Not all workers have lost ground to inflation. Some workers are even further ahead or behind in their race against inflation, depending on the specific industry in which they work. Bankrate's analysis found that pay has risen faster than inflation in two industries, leisure and hospitality, at 23.7%, and accommodation and food service, 23.3%, compared with a 20% rise in prices from the start of 2021 in the end of June. Paychecks are furthest behind in education, 13.6%, construction, 14.1%, and financial activities, 14.3% during the same time frame. Meanwhile, after increasing at a faster rate than inflation in Bankrate's 2023 Wage to Inflation Index, pay in the retail sector, 
up 19.4% since the beginning of 2021, has since fallen behind. The industries where wage growth has boomed correspond with where labor demand was the strongest. At one point, a record 11.1% of jobs within the accommodation and food services sector and 10.9% of positions within leisure and hospitality were vacant, the most of any other industry. On the flip side, job opening rates in the industries with the slowest wage growth peaked at much lower levels, with construction at 5.4% and education hitting 4% according to bank rates analysis. That's not to say Americans in inflation-beating industries are feeling particularly better off. The average hourly earnings of workers in the financial activity sector, $45.73 for example, are more than two times as high as those in leisure and hospitality at $22.18. The more money workers make, the better position they are to absorb higher prices in their budgets. Low-income households tend to spend more money on essentials that they can't cut back on, whereas upper-income Americans have more options to free up cash, such as trimming discretionary spending or their savings contributions. Workers making less than 50000 a year at 43% were nearly twice as likely as those who earned 100000 or more a year. 24% to feel that they're living paycheck to paycheck, according to Bankrate survey from July. Americans working jobs in retail, leisure, and hospitality and food services were also more likely to have lost their jobs during the pandemic, making it hard to say whether they're truly better off today, says Elise Gould, a senior economist at the Independent Economic Policy Institute. Even if their wages have risen, it has been very hard for people to make ends meet on the kind of wages that our labor market has been delivering over the last 50 years, Gould says. But the fact that people are struggling doesn't mean that they didn't experience real wage growth. Both things can be true. I don't know if it'll get as good as it was. Robert Santee, a psychotherapist based in Connecticut, has taken on 20 extra clients in the four years since the pandemic. He says the decision was equal parts personal necessity and societal urgency. For starters, every corner of Santee's budget has grown more expensive. Car insurance for his family of five is costing him $10,000 a year. His monthly electric bills often range between $600 and $800. His cell phone bill jumped by $40 a month, and even his grocery costs can easily reach $1,000 a week. He's taken on longer hours simply to replace some of his lost income. It's nickel and dime, nickel and dime, and everyone wants a piece of the pie, he says. My pie keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But whether it's lingering stress from the pandemic or financial anxiety surrounding inflation and recession fears, Santi says he's been in no need for clientele over the past four years either. He often takes calls from patients after hours and goes to his office on weekends to catch up on paperwork. He estimates that he gets about four cold calls a week from new inquiring clients whom he has to turn away because he doesn't have enough room for them in his schedule. People are highly stressed, highly anxious, struggling financially. That leads to family squabbles, relationship issues, he said. You get the cable company, the electric company, the cell phone company, your mortgage goes up, your taxes go up. Any one thing might be manageable, but when it's death by a thousand needles, that just wears on people over time. Contributing to his rising expenditures, his two youngest children are in college, while his oldest daughter is living at home on an extended job hunt after graduating two years ago. He and his wife are now earning nearly $300,000 a year as a household, but they feel like they had an easier time getting by when they were in their early 20s earning just $22,000 a year. Still feeling surprised by bills or unexpected expenses, he's had to temporarily halt his retirement contributions. I'm certainly in better shape financially than I've ever been in my life, but I'm not where I thought I was going to be or where I think I should be, Santi says. 
It'll get better, but I don't know if it'll get as good as it was. I realize everything goes up and up and up, but did it have to go up so much so quickly when I didn't have time to adjust? It felt like it just happened overnight. Even if wages recover, inflation may have already damaged the American psyche. Americans look at inflation differently than economists. Analysts track annual rates of change in inflation to determine whether the U.S. economy is overheating, while the typical American consumer focuses on how much the items they see every day have risen in cost. Just 6% of the nearly 400 items the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks are cheaper today than before the pandemic. A bank rate analysis of inflation data shows key essentials that consumers regularly buy, like gasoline, groceries, utilities, rent, and more, have risen at a faster rate than overall inflation. Car insurance, meanwhile, is up almost 50% since February 2020. Inflation can have a profound effect on consumer psychology. Nearly half of the adults, 47%, say money has a negative impact on their mental health, at least occasionally, Bankrate's Money and Mental Health Survey from May 2024 found. Almost two-thirds of them, 65%, cited rising prices as a reason. It will require that workers continue to enjoy some restoration of buying power through real wage gains, Hamrick says, referring to when Americans could start to feel better. To the extent we see falling prices for goods within a fairly normal, not recessionary economic environment, that would be helpful. Ricardo is already gearing up for his annual review next month. He's preparing to make a case for why he deserves a bigger raise than usual, citing his sales numbers and translating how it adds to his company's bottom line. He hopes to use the money to visit his five grandchildren, who live across the country in both Florida and Seattle. And even if he doesn't get the money he's hoping for, he says he's unlikely to quit. He hopes to retire within the next few years and is afraid of taking a pay cut by starting over somewhere else. I'm waiting for them to one day tell me, don't worry, we'll take care of you. That's what you want to hear after 16 years, he says. Hopefully, I don't get disappointed with what I'm going to hear. Trump unveils crypto project, says U.S. should dominate sector. This is an article by Olga Karif and Stephanie Lai from Bloomberg News. Donald Trump headlined an event billed as the unveiling of a crypto platform promoted by the Republican nominee and his sons, putting the spotlight on a niche digital asset sector with a history of controversy. The project, World Liberty Financial, will be part of the decentralized finance segment of digital assets and is supposed to help with financial security and being able to transact freely, Trump's son's Donald Jr. said in an X Spaces live stream on Monday. It's a real problem that needed to be addressed, and honestly, I think this is the way, Donald Jr. said after comments from his father. The launch came a day after the former president emerged unscathed from a second apparent assassination attempt, the latest shock to royal the presidential contest. The Republican nominee has pivoted to courting the digital asset sector in search of do- donations and votes amid a tight race for the White House, even vowing to make the United States the crypto capital of the planet. His stance is an about face given that he previously denounced Bitcoin as a scam. On the goal of becoming the key crypto hub, Donald Trump said, if we don't do it, China is going to do it. China is doing it anyway. But if we don't do it, we're not going to be the biggest, and we have to be the biggest and the best. Trump's sons, Eric and Donald Jr., began promoting World Liberty Financial on X and Telegram in recent weeks. Decentralized Finance, or DeFi, is an arcane crypto sector where people trade, lend, and borrow digital assets peer-to-peer using automated software. The effort is consistent with Trump's pro-crypto policy stance, said Campbell Harvey, a finance professor at Duke University. It's one thing to say you are pro-crypto and another to launch a company in the space. 
The former president's profile may make many more people aware of DeFi, prom proponents of which often claim gains in efficiency resulting from cutting out traditional intermediaries like banks. Critics argue the sector rests in a regulatory gray zone and is prone to hacks, a bugbear for crypto as a whole. Want cheaper college? Pay interest while in school. This article is by Eliza Haverstock and Kat Tretina. A typical four-year degree can cost $115,000 or more, according to a 2023 College Board report. Borrowing money to pay for college adds to the total cost due to interest. Federal student loan interest rates range from 6.53% for undergraduate borrowers to 9.08% for parents. Private student loans have an even greater range and the rate you get generally depends on your credit. To lower the overall cost of your education, consider making optional student loan payments while you're in school or during your grace period. Even if you can only afford a small amount, every payment you make will decrease the amount of interest that accrues. You could save thousands over the life of your loan. Interest begins accruing on most private student loans and some federal student loans as soon as students receive the money, even if payments aren't due, says Jill Dejean, Senior Policy Analyst with the National Association of Student Financial Aid Administrators. Nerdy tip, there is one exception. If you qualify for federal subsidized direct loans, the government covers the interest charges while you're in school and during your grace period. The impact of making student and loan payments while in school. Paying even small amounts while you're in school can add up. Consider this hypothetical example. Let's say you take out $10,000 your first year of school at 6.53% interest in a 10-year repayment term. Here's how different repayment amounts impact your total savings. If you don't make in-school payments, you'll pay $141 per month once your repayment period starts. By the end of your repayment term, you'll pay a total of $17,653. If you pay $25 per month while in school, you'll pay $132 per month once your repayment period starts. By the end of your repayment term, you'll pay a total of $17,161, a savings of $492. If you pay $50 per month while in school, you'll pay $116 per month once your repayment period starts. By the end of your repayment term, you'll be you'll pay a total of $16,669, a savings of $984. If you pay $100 per month while in school, you'll pay $86 per month once your repayment period starts. By the end of your repayment term, you'll pay a total of $15,686, a savings of $1,967. If you have multiple loans and can't afford to make payments towards all of them, pay the one with the higher interest rate first, says Amy Linz, Vice President of Customer Success with Money Management International, a nonprofit financial education agency. Making payments will also help you avoid the effects of capitalization, where interest is capitalized and added to your principal balance. Capitalization is typically what people mean when they talk about paying interest on your interest. By making payments while in college, you can cut down on the amount that's capitalized, preventing your loan balance from ballooning out of control. When should you skip in-school payments? Depending on your circumstances, making in-school payments may not make sense. If you fit into one of the following groups, you may be better off De deferring your payments until you leave school and your grace period ends. You can adjust your budget. If you find that you can afford to pay $50 or more per month, you may need to rethink your budget and approach to borrowing. While making payments during school can save students, student loan borrowers money, the cheapest option is to not borrow at all because of loan origination fees, Dejan says. 
If you're in a position to make payments on your loans during school, examine whether you can use that extra money to pay for school expenses directly without borrowing. Similarly, if you borrow money, the school will send you a check for the excess amount after covering your tuition and fees. You can use the cash to cover other educational expenses, including your textbooks and meal plan. But according to Robert Farrington, founder of the College Investor, those excess dollars are an opportunity to reduce your debt. I would always encourage you to minimize lifestyle expenses, he says. Maybe get an extra roommate or anything you can do to save money, and then you can take that refund and put it right towards your student loan. Even if you wait until the end of the semester or the end of the academic year, I would throw it right back at your student loans ahead of time instead of keeping that. You're pursuing loan forgiveness. If you're planning on working as a teacher or for a nonprofit organization, you may qualify for loan forgiveness under Public Service Loan Forgiveness, or PSLF, so making extra payments may not make sense. If you're working in public service and qualify for PSLF, you could end up a lot wealthier in life by paying as little as legally allowed on your loan and receiving loan forgiveness, Farrington said. If you know what direction you're taking while in college, you can give yourself a head start. You have other debt? Your student loans may not be the only form of debt you have, and if you have other debt with higher rates, it may be financially wise to target the highest interest debt first. If someone has accumulated credit card debt, for example, that's likely to be at a much higher interest rate than student loans, says Linz, and I would tackle that first to keep the credit card balance from growing. You have subsidized federal student loans. If you have subsidized federal student loans, which are available to students with financial need, interest does not accrue while you're in school or during your six-month grace period. If you have this type of loan, your balance won't be larger upon leaving school than it was when the loan was dispersed. However, making in-school payments, if you're able, can still help you in the long run because interest will accrue on a smaller balance once you leave school. Thank you for joining us for the Sterling News, read by Nefeli Schneider.